Cornerstone family and friends, great to have you this morning. We're going to continue our series arc, which is Acts, Romans, and Corinthians. Today we're looking at Acts chapter 22. My topic this morning is the sting of rejection. So if we just take a moment and look back to our last chapter in chapter 21, Paul had been rescued and brought into Roman protection. The mob was about to take his life. They were beating him. And of course, the Roman centurion and all of the soldiers that were with him were able to take Paul out of that situation. And they started to take him to the barracks where he'd be in their protection and their control. As they're there, Paul asked, may I have a moment to speak to the crowd? And he begins to talk to them in their common language, the Aramaic language of that day. And Paul began to share his testimony of what had happened and also his healing, uh, where his eyesight was restored. So we're going to jump into Acts chapter 22 today. And in verse 3 to 5, it says, Paul declares this, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as you, any of you are today. I had persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can testify themselves. I even obtained letters from them to, and to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And so when we take a look at this whole scenario in Acts chapter 21, we're aware of the fact that, that uh, Paul has come to a place of of uh, unfortunately being beaten by the Jews. He's trying to make a defense. And here he is speaking in their common language. He points out a couple things. Here's his credentials. He says, I'm one of you. I'm a Jew. He also states that I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, in, which is in today's modern Turkey. And so here he is, he's saying, I was born a Roman citizen. He was also, as he indicates to this group of people, I am trained by Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was a rabbi in Jerusalem, uh, a man of distinction, and, and Paul was thoroughly trained in the law. Basically, Paul was being prepared to be a rabbi himself and be prepared to be in leadership. So he would be part of the Sanhedrin, uh, the court of Israel, so to speak, in the temple. Paul points out that he was zealous. Just like the crowd that is in front of him, he's saying, I, I am just as zealous as you are. And he acknowledged the fact that he had persecuted Christians, that he arrested them, and that he had letters from the high priest and the council to chase after people that were of the way. And so here's Paul sharing where he's come from, and he's telling them his background so that they can understand. And he's talking to them in their language. He goes on in verses 6 to 10 and then 14 to 21, and it says, this is Paul's testimony. About noon as I came near to Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions, they saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. And Paul said, he said, what shall I do, Lord? Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. And there you'll be told all that you've been assigned to do. Verse 14 carries on. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witnesses to all people of what you've seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. This is what Ananias told him as Ananias came to pray over him and God healed his vision again. So he, he got up and it says, when I returned to Jerusalem, was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and, the, and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your to testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue, synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to Paul, go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So here's Paul, and he's sharing with them the calling that God put on his heart. Paul basically encountered Jesus on his road to Damascus. 
And in that light and that voice that took place, Paul was challenged with the, the words, why are you persecuting me? And, and Paul's response is, Lord, well, who are you? And the voice, the one that's speaking to him, identifies him as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, of course, Jesus of Nazareth had been crucified and he was, he was dead. And, and the, the claim of the apostles and the disciples and people in Jerusalem is that he was risen. So here's Jesus of Nazareth. The Lord Jesus is speaking into Paul. So the instruction of the Lord is to go to Damascus and you're going to get your assignment there. So my question was, why? Why, why did God do that? Like, why did that have to happen that way? Could it be obedience? Um, could it be a demonstration of God's power and healing? Because Paul in that encounter was blind and they led him into Damascus. He was led by the hand to come into that city. Perhaps it was submission where Paul is healed. He's baptized to show that his sins are washed away and that he became a follower of Jesus. And while he's in Jerusalem, Paul recaps this that the Lord told him that he was going to send him to the Gentiles. So here's Paul's calling, his commission, that Jesus is saying to him, come and follow me. When we go on into Acts chapter 22, and verses 22 to 23, it says, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. And then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As soon as they heard that he was being sent to the Gentiles, these upstanding Jews, these righteous Jews felt like, this is God's law. It's for the Jewish people. That's not for those Gentiles. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks, they flung dust in the air. They were so upset. So again, why? Well, the Greek word for throwing may be actually translated as waving or shaking. So their clothes, they're probably shaking them in a fury. They're mad. They're angry. And if you recall, Jesus even told his disciples to shake off the dust from their sandals when they left a community that they refused to listen to the message. And so basically what was happening here, the mob is rejecting everything that Paul is saying and everything that he represents. So as I looked at this, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of times people deal with rejection. Must have been a very hard day for Paul as a Jew, as an upstanding Jew, as a man who is taught in the law and trained there in Jerusalem. He's looking at these crowd, this crowd of people and he's, he's hearing the complete rejection of him. In fact, they're uttering threats of death upon Paul. A lot of people struggle with rejection. It's an awful experience for all of us to go through. And uh, Carolyn Joyce from psychalive.org just mentions a few things to help deal with rejection. There are different types of rejection. There's career setbacks, there can be relationship uh, fragmentation and breakups, friendships that go off course. Uh, you can have rejection from a family member. And even in today's society, a lot of times there is social media rejection. And the cancel culture can wipe people off the map as, as we've seen in so many people's lives. So how to deal with rejection? Carolyn points out, shift your perspective. Fixed mindsets tend to blame self. Your personality is kind of, well, this is how they operate. This is who they are. And so that kind of fixed mindset, you find that you tend to get into a place of blaming, self-blaming particularly, versus a growth mindset where one recognizes that life is, is flexible and losses actually can provide an opportunity for growth and change. Another thing she says, pay attention to your inner critic. You know, a lot of times their inner critic is very critical. They're negative, uh, judgmental comments that will roll around in our mind. And often they undermine and sabotage, which can really cause us to actually shut down or even withdraw. There's also a tendency, she says, is that people will look at, through rose-colored glasses. They'll look at events and they'll say, well, maybe things weren't so bad. And, and they, they, also, they often find that as they look in that, they tend to blame self. So rejection actually causes us to feel angry in many cases. We feel um, unworthy. We didn't measure up to somebody's expectation or their, their bar in life, so to speak. She points out it's important to practice self-compassion. And that has really three key elements that she points out. First, self-kindness versus self-judgment. 
We need to treat ourselves like we would treat a friend, where we would use sensitivity and empathy in our friendship. Secondly, she says, there is a common humanity versus isolation that we should keep into consideration when it comes to self-compassion. Remember that others can experience this as well. It's not just our own rejection, but many people feel that. And she challenges us to stay connected and, and be engaged with people that matter in our lives. Thirdly, she says, mindfulness versus identification. And that is to be aware of the present and be present. It's okay to recognize our feelings. The feelings that we experience, though, do not have to distort. And so when we're dealing with re rejection, it's one thing to acknowledge our feelings, but don't let them distort the, the situation that has taken place. She goes on to say, avoid a victimized mindset. A lot of times when people are rejected, they feel they're unworthy. It's all my fault. You know, people are, people are mad with me. And you have to really step back and take a look. Sometimes people have made choices because of the things that are happening in their life. And they may just blame you, but they're not dealing with their own issues. And finally, she says, embrace your individuality and make connections to your past. Stay connected with the things that have grounded you and built you for who you are today. When it comes to rejection, a lot of times people have stated certain things um, in quotes, and I thought these, a couple of these were really good. Harvey McKay says, most fears of rejection rest on the desire for the approval from other people. Don't base your self-esteem on their opinions. You know, it's so true. We, we often think that based on people's approval will de determine who we are in life. But don't base your, your self-esteem on their opinions. Ash Sweeney says, rejection doesn't have to mean you aren't good enough. It often just means the other person failed to notice what you have to offer. I like that. James Lee Burke said, there's nothing like rejection to make you do an inventory of yourself. And truly, when we do have rejection, we do do a little bit of self-analysis, don't we? We try to check out what's going on and what happened here. Henry Nguyen said, the greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power, but self-rejection. And a lot of times when people get into a place where they've been rejected, they will bombard self. Then they'll blame self and they'll say they're not worthy. And, and sometimes that can really become a catastrophic event in a person's life where they refuse to move forward or grow. Lecrae stated, if we live for people's acceptance, we will die from their rejection. I really think that sometimes when it comes to rejection, we put a lot of emphasis on other people's opinions and thoughts, but we forget who are we? What are we? What has made us in life? Who are the people that have influenced our life? And where are we going in life? As Paul is dealing with this crowd, and they are now calling out for his death, and they're throwing around their, their garments, and they're throwing dust in the air. They're just saying, we want nothing to do with this guy. Murder him. Put him to death. He's not worthy to live. We find that the commander now orders Paul to be taken into the barracks. And he directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. It goes on to say, as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion who was standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are we going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. And those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The commander went to the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. And then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. What we're finding here is really the beginning of the journey to Rome. So as he is now in the custody of the Roman commander and the soldiers that are in that particular barrack, 
Paul is now about to face the challenge of being taken from his Jewish land, the Jerusalem High Council, all these things are about to start the process that would see Paul, as we go into the rest of the book of Acts, being led and going to be imprisoned and eventually come to Rome to make a defense of what had taken place in his life there in Jerusalem. Here we find this is the beginning of really the fulfillment of prophecy. Up until this point, we had heard that as Paul was coming towards Jerusalem, and if you recall, that the prophet came and took the belt of, of, of um, Paul's tunic and tied his hands and his wrist, uh, tied his wrists and his feet rather, and showed that this would be the word of the Lord. He'd be bound by those in Jerusalem and they'd be given over to the Gentiles. And so here we find now Paul is beginning the journey to get ready to go to Rome. It's interesting that Paul was subject to the Roman centurion and the commander that he was stretched out to be flogged. He was going to be treated as a criminal without having a case and brought before a judge and to have a verdict. So when the commander who intended to whip and interrogate Paul discovered Paul's comment, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty? He was totally alarmed. The commander realized that he had put Paul in chains. And when we go back into history, Roman citizens were not to be beaten or bound without a legal case and defense. Because what Paul could do based on Roman law, he could use a Porcian and a Valerian law, and he could accuse them, those commanders, centurion, and soldiers, and they would be brought before their superiors and they would be subject to the law and found guilty of binding up and preparing to flog, whip a Roman citizen without due diligence of law. Now, when it comes to rejection, as we've kind of alluded that in today's message, the Bible talks to us about how we can handle rejection. And I wanna just end with these kind of thoughts today. Crystal McDowell shared what Christians want to know dot com her her comments regarding how to handle rejection biblically. She said, Accept the truth that God made you beautiful. Psalm one thirty nine verse four says, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. She wanted us to realize that God loves us, that we are considered his treasures, that he has formed us and we are wonderfully made. God thinks we're beautiful. She says, secondly, accept the truth that God created you for a special purpose. In Jeremiah 29, 11, this was a word of the Lord to Israel. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God not only cares for nations, but he also cares for the people of those nations. And God has plans for our lives. If we will surrender and allow him to lead us, God will lead our life. He wants to be part of the journey. Thirdly, Crystal says, accept the truth that God doesn't have favorites. Now in Romans 2.11, it says, for God does not show favoritism. In fact, God looks at the heart of every person. He knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart is what the Bible says. So when we know that God knows our thoughts and intents, we know that God accepts us for who we are. In fact, every person who comes to him, to God, we know in scripture that God will not reject us, but we will be received by him. She goes on and fifthly says, fourthly says, accept the truth that God can heal your past hurts. In Psalm 147 verse three, it declares he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. God is quite capable of Healing the rejection, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, he can heal us if we will turn to him. And lastly, fifth point, she states, accept the truth that God can use your hurts to help others. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, we're reminded, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. If you, like Paul, have experienced rejection in your life, the Lord Jesus himself was rejected by men. The Lord Jesus was rejected to the point where he was crucified and put to death. But God would not allow his Holy One to see corruption 
or to stay permanently in the grave. And the Bible says that he resurrected, he brought to life the Lord Jesus. And Jesus now has ascended to the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us that he makes intercession on our behalf. If we call upon the Lord, he will save us. And I just want to encourage you this morning, when it comes to feelings of rejection, feelings of disappointment when people do not favor you or have your back, there is one who never turns his back on you, and that's the Lord. If you call out to him, God will give you the strength and the helps and the journey. And next week, we're going to look at how God began to do this in Paul's life as he prepared the way for him to go to, to, to Rome rather, and to share the message of the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I pray that whoever is out there listening today that has heard these words about rejection and maybe identifies and relates to those things, that you would be the healer of those hurts and those wounds and that you would restore and allow your strength to flow into people's lives, that they may walk out of those things that have tied up their lives. I pray for favor this week, that we would be able to go forward, touch people's lives around us and make a difference. God, thank you for the life of Paul and his influence during his generation. Help us to be reminded that we too have an opportunity to be an influence for you to the people that are around us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Have a great week ahead. Take care.